Hello and welcome to another episode of We're Not Wizards. My name's Richard. I will be your host. Now, today is going to be another quick start on the kickstart. And a quick start on a kickstart is quite simple. What happens is it is when we get a games designer who is in the middle of their kickstarter campaign. And the reason that we're doing that is because I look at campaigns on Kickstarter sometimes and I say, oh, I'd be interested in speaking to that person. So joining me today is John D. Clare, who is currently kickstarting the rather doing very, very well <laughs> um, downfall. But it's not only downfall, it's downfall deluxified. So hello, John. Thanks for coming hey. on the show. Hey, thanks. You- thanks for having me. That's good. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Th- it's, um, um, thanks for coming on. Um, because, um, as I say, tonight we're gonna have, or tonight, or today, or whenever anybody's listening, we're gonna have a little chat about the, about the campaign, how it's progressing, and give you a chance to kind of like tell people who are maybe not heard the downfall before, or who are hovering over that pledge button, give you a chance to kind of talk about it a little bit more. Um, but first of all, a couple of things we need to make everybody aware. Um, the first thing is the reason that we do this is because we believe that there's quite simply not enough podcasts out there about board games. We have scoured the internet. In fact, we almost reached the edge of the internet. Still haven't found any other podcasts out there. And as I say, the second reason that we're doing this is because um, Downfall Campaign's got a really good amount of attention there's a bit of a buzz about it it's not only funded just now it's reached um, double its figures so as I say we've got John on today to to have a chat about himself really so we want to find out a little bit about his history so we want to have a little bit of a I guess a look back into the past a kind of a a peek into the present before we um, head on down to his future to see what's happening there. So again, thank you, John, for coming on. It's much appreciated you taking the time out today. Um, do you want to? Um, do you want to maybe start off by telling us a little bit about how you got into the into the kind of the world of kind of um, pressed and coloured trees, as they would say. <laughs> uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, and again, thanks for having me. Um, I was always a um, nerdy kid and inclined towards games. Um, uh, I was one of those kids where, you know, anytime a game was brought out, I would sort of gravitate towards the table, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't really get into the... So, so I would... It's going way back, right? You know, I was <laughs> yeah. a kid... I was a kid when Pokemon was a big thing. Um, uh, uh, and when Magic was first going, right? So... Those were a couple of my first introductions to the nerdier realm of board gaming. Yeah. Um, I didn't. I didn't end up collecting Pokemon cards, um, and it was actually that was sort of one of the catalysts of my initial design efforts as a nine-year-old. Oh, all right. Uh, was, okay. I was in, I was I was introduced to Pokemon <laughs> cards uh, by friends who were collecting it, but knowing my parents, it wasn't. I didn't. I didn't expect to succeed at asking them to buy me Pokemon cards for me. So, so rather than rather than trying, yeah. I decided to design my own game, um, which um, was reminiscent of Pokemon. It was, it was little cards with monsters, and but it was a dice-based battle where the monsters really? would fight each other with dice. What was um, it? Called? Did you give it a name? It's called Monster Cards. Very, well, I... very creatively. I, I don't know, I think there's an awful lot to be said for a game that you can hear the title and then know exactly what that game is going to be about. Right, you, you know what to expect. <laughs> exactly. Cards with monsters. There's too many clever names going about and you have to really, really look into them to even discover what you're kind of getting, your, getting yourself into, you know, like Downfall, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the, <laughs> I don't know if you're. I don't know if you're. Maybe we're we're young enough at the time, but there was a game called Downfall, which I, I, I am know, aware of the yeah the Hasbro the, kind of, game, the Hasbro yeah. kind of. Oh right, if you had the letter from them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't. I haven't gotten a notice from Hasbro. But, oh my uh, goodness! But yes, that one is very different than my Downfall. Um, 
<laughs> so, um, do you have, did you give your monsters names? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I went, I think I ended up with like 200 some unique cards and yeah. um, a bunch of my friends were started playing it. Um, there was, we'd have, you know, get togethers. So I was uh, another little fact of my childhood. Yeah. I was homeschooled. Um, oh, me okay. and my sister were both homeschooled, and we had we lived in Los Angeles, so we had uh-huh. we actually had a pretty big group of other families that homeschooled their children. Uh-huh. So we had a pretty wide net of um, similarly nerdy or um, <laughs> dorky inclined kids, and uh, we all we all played a lot of games together. And when I invented monster cards and started showing to them, and again I'm like I'm like nine and ten years old, right? Yeah. Started showing these cards to the other kids. Some of them got interested in it they they would make their own cards and you know the next time i would see them they'd be like john look 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 i made some cards what do you think um <laughs> do you look at them and say you can't do that you you can't have combine those powers <laughs> together. that cards bro- so there was de- there was definitely those so i had i had an idea of game balance right yeah. um back then uh I, I can't say i was good at it right but i had a, a notion of game balance and you know um a lot of the kids who played the game their, their first inclination was to go make their own card which was the best card ever conceivable right yeah though though i i I should give them a decent amount of credit there i saw ridiculously overpowered cards but i also saw reasonable cards coming from other kids right and there was there was a whole element to that game of sort of silly absurdness so a lot of people would intentionally make like the worst card ever just because it was funny um well that's a worthwhile pursuit it it was good times it was good times um did you make, did you have, because the Pokemon series have got a tendency nowadays to call things lots of letters and have lots of letter letter X's and stuff like that. So it's, you know, the DX, EX, XX, Expo, XO, 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 Dex, 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 Tolamon, Pokemon. <laughs> did you have, what was the kind of the most powerful card that you had at the time? Do you remember, did you have one that you went, yeah, you're my boy, and you went out and you got some foil and you put some foil around the edges of it. We didn't. You... We, I didn't go so far as to put foil on my little cardstock hand-drawn <laughs> cards. Did you not? Were, no, I didn't were, go that far. Were they felt tip? Were, did you wait until you were confident to use felt tip? Did you start off with color pencil? Did it you... was all color pencils. Yep. Was it? What was the name? Uh, going. What was the name of the most powerful card or the car- cards you were most proud of? And don't say you can't remember because you can remember, John. The initial. The initial most powerful card. Though yeah. it was later surpassed, but it but it still sort of stands up yeah. as the most as the most powerful one was a card called Ermacan. <laughs> <laughs> all it's all one word. It's spelled you know starting with an E R M. It's all you know supposed to be like a fantasy monster name, Ermacan. Um, yeah, he cool. was he was strong. Um, it, you know, by the end of the game, he was still one of the strong monsters, but mm. there have been some that had surpassed him. Okay, so um, did you? I take it you, are these cards now gone? Are they disappeared into the kind of the history, or is it a potentiality when you're taking your partner around to meet your parents for the first time that they're going to bring open a box and say, "And here's John's monster cards," kind of thing? My parents do not have my monster cards. I do. Oh, you've got them still! <laughs> oh man, <laughs> do you still have Armican? I'm sure I could dig him up. Oh wow, you've got to send me a picture of Ermacan so you can use it for the artwork on the show notes. This has to happen. Oh wow, that's amazing. See, I love this because I love people's first steps into creativity because there's some people that like, say like Frank West and his first game was like he took Monopoly and put an Egyptian theme on it and then yes. you get, and then I think um, Brad was doing, Brad Talton, Brad D. Talton was doing battling cards but you're, this is fantastic. <laughs> this, is it? I mean, so you did that. I mean, is this? Did this kind of start you on the route that you were like, well, if I'm not going to get these things, then I'm going to make myself stuff. Is that did that kind of start you on the route to kind of making other things then? So that was. Um, I got to give my mom in particular credit for that. That was that was sort of her philosophy. Her homeschooling philosophy was, let's not buy it, let's make it. Mm-hmm. Certainly, when it came to any sort of. Um, fun type of things. So we, we, we definitely had toys, right, as kids. Yeah, yeah. But a lot of things, you know, um, I think it was my, one of, like, my sixth, is a perfect example, right? My seventh birthday, for example, mm, yeah. um, was a Batman birthday party, and 
rather than go buy a Batman piata, pinata, yeah. yeah, we made a paper mache pinata of the penguin for um for the for the party, right? So stuff like that was that was sort of the philosophy of my mom um, homeschooling us was let's make it. It's a commendable thing to do. I bet you you're absolutely deadly with some paste and some newspaper. <laughs> If you get into a situation, you turn like to beat like B.A. Baracus used to do in the A team. <laughs> How are you going to get out of this, John? You tell so, you what, you hand so me the, that wallpaper face. <laughs> the the pinata that we made, as I recall, um, was actually unbreakable. Um, <laughs> for uh, unbreakable for like six and seven year olds, right? So we had oh we had goodness. like a little t-ball bat, right? And yeah. You know, the the kids at the party are taking turns whacking this thing and, like, barely putting a dent into it. Um, you know, I mean, we were probably going at it for a good 15 minutes before is it like any, Steve, any Steve? candy came out. And my dad, my dad eventually, we're like, all right, whatever. My dad eventually pulls out his, his like, you know, full-size grown-up baseball bat and just in one <laughs> swing just blasts the thing into pieces oh, and, like, candy goodness. goes flying across the entire parking lot. So it's yeah, like I remember that. that was, those were good times. <laughs> like Steve Martin in Parenthood <laughs> exactly the same thing happens <laughs> Steve Martin ends up taking a saw to the head of this donkey <laughs> and trying to take the top off of it it's just classic Steve Martin um, <laughs> so um, moving on I, I could just we could just talk about your childhood and we could just you know do a <laughs> thing at the end for downfall just go, go look at the link because this is an awful lot more fun um <laughs> Did you continue that during the years? And as I said, did this kind of set you off? You were always kind of constantly making games. I mean, is do you have your own version of Settlers of Catan? Did you have your own version of Monopoly? You know, as you went on, did you did you continue with the games, or did you go through that period where you went away and did college and stuff like that, and then found yourself back into the kind of board game thing? So games. Game design was always something that I was sort of drawn to. Um, yeah. There was Monster Cards. There was another little sci-fi game I made called Space Wars. Right. Um, later, um, I was actually gifted a whole bunch of Magic cards from someone who was someone in the homeschool community. Their family was moving away, mm-hmm. and the dad was a big Magic: The Gathering player, and he gifted me when he was leaving, like. I don't know, 5,000 common cards that he had oh. and a handful of uncommon. So I can get any rares out of it, right? But I, but I, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, yeah, let me be generous to you, boy. Oh, thanks. No, very no, much. I mean, I mean, that was a huge collection. And there was some, there was some commons in there that, um, this was back in the Urza Saga era of magic. Um, All right. And, uh, you know, there was some really good commons in there, right? So that sort of put me down the path of playing magic. Yeah. Um, and a handful of my friends got into it. Um, me and uh, a couple of my best friends, uh, one in particular, we we came up with a game called Together came called uh, Chaos Cards, which oh. was which was like another trading card style um, game. Uh-huh. Uh, and then we came up with we came up with a couple games along that lines. I was always coming up with the games. I came up with a board game later mm-hmm. in high school. That was sort of an adventure game um, with a hex based board, and you would explore tiles as you went. Um, no, so none of these games were very good, um, but uh, it was, and I wasn't, I was probably introduced to Settlers in my teen years, um, but I wasn't really introduced to the wider world of board games until college, yeah. and re- and really not until after college when I sort of started exploring it myself as an adult. Yeah. Um, so in college I played... Um, Diplomacy for the first time. I played Citadels for the first time. Yeah, Ticket to Ride, right? Yeah, you can imagine getting invited round to come, Don. Come on, we're going to try some. We're going going to try some diplomacy. Oh man, don't do um, don't do cardboard. No, no, come on, try it. You might like it. It's kind of like peer pressure. You sitting around with a group of friends going, go on. No, no, go on. Move the counter. See how you feel. You might just like it, kind of thing. <laughs> and they kind of grew, grew on from there. You know. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of people that spent their college years playing um, <laughs> playing games like that, and Dungeons it's only and later. Dragons, on. Oh yeah, yeah. Did you play a lot of Dungeon D and D as well? No, I had I had a few friends who got into it. Yeah. In high school, I never got it. So 
I probably would have got into it if it wasn't for baseball. Um, mm. So my my competing interests uh, was nerdy uh, nerdy things like board games, and then um, being an athlete. So I played. Um, played golf, played tennis, played soccer, but primarily mm. played baseball um, all the way through college, actually. Did um, that um, baseball come? Did that come from that day with the penguin piñata, where you kind of <laughs> you got your no, swing from there? It was, it was, it was, it was sort of destined. My dad was a big baseball fan, so all oh, right, okay. Um, I think the day I was born, the gift he gave me as an infant, as, as like a as a one day year old, right? Yeah, was a baseball. You know? Really? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I was I was trying the, the you know I was probably throwing a ball before I was walking. Um, so you know in high school, um, I, I I spent a lot of time playing baseball and D and D is one of those very time consuming um, games and and I I played it a couple times I enjoyed mm-hmm. it. Um, I'm I'm much more inclined towards strategy than story driven games. Yeah, I en- I enjoy both. Um, I'll happily play a good story-driven co-op game. Yeah. Um, but if I'm going to pick what game to play, it's going to be a strategy com- competitive game, right? Mm-hmm. So what um, what kind of things have kind of, um, I guess, taken your fancy at the moment? Is there any, I mean, there's. let's face it, you can run outside and throw a brick and you can hit, hit a board game nowadays. There's kind of so many of them kind of kicking about, but... Is there anything at the moment that you've kind of played recently that you've thought, yeah, actually, this is um, this is good fun, or has all your time been taken <laughs> taken up with the Kickstarter campaign? Actually, I'm not um, I'm not too involved with the Kickstarter campaign. Uh, mm. We can get into that more later. But uh, all right, to, okay. your, to your original question, yeah, what have I been playing a lot lately? Yeah, um, I, I have been playtesting a lot. Um, uh, I would I would say. 75% of my gaming nowadays is either playing, testing my games, uh-huh. um, other games that AEG is working on, yeah, or prototypes from other designer f- people that I know in the designer community in Los Angeles. All right. The okay. other, the other 25% is is playing, um, you know, uh, published games, mm. um, which. I, I usually try to focus on playing new games as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I play a lot of games at least once. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, and and you know if I stop designing tomorrow, I would I would play a lot more other games, <laughs> right? Um, but the design efforts, you know, take up a lot of that time. Um, yeah. But yeah. I definitely I want to play as many other games as I can. Okay. Um, and fortunately, in LA, there's a robust gaming community so finding finding game events and places and friends houses to get games in is not it's not a challenge in LA oh, that's cool. um, probably the, the the new game I've played the recently published game I've played the most yeah lately is Bunny Kingdom I've heard so much about <laughs> Bunny Kingdom I've heard I have most... I have yet to play a Richard Garfield game that I don't enjoy um, so I, I, I was. I had it, high what, expectations for this one, and it didn't let me down. What is it with Richard Garfield? <laughs> just like, do you know what I mean? He's just, he just must make wake up in the morning, and every day in Richard Garfield's world must be about being successful and getting it right. Because I don't think there's. I've walked away from a game and I've went, you know, there was all right, but if I had one thing, I would change. I would change that. He, he just seems to kind of produce nice little bits of genius after nice little bits of genius. Bunny Kingdom is, it's kind of, it's a, it's a kind of a, st- people have said to me what it is, is you, you go along for the cuteness and then you're, you, it bends your brain with the amount of strategy that's kind of involved in it. Um, I mean, what's it, what's it kind of about? What is it you liking, what is it you liking about Bunny Kingdom at the moment? Um, there's a number of things to like, um, primarily probably the, pace of the game which is very fast mm. and the fact that every de- most decisions in the game are not necessarily well there's a handful of obvious decisions in the game yeah. um, but uh, most decisions are interesting and at least half not obvious 
uh-huh. right? As uh-huh. in, as in every turn you draft two cards, yeah. right? And almost every turn, one of those two cards isn't an obvious decision, right? So <laughs> it combines, it combines, um, uh, and sometimes both are, right? Um, so it combines a really quick play, um, which, which is the benefit of a drafting style game mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. with, um, with interesting decisions. Now that's something Seven Wonders does, right? Yeah. Um, but Bunny Kingdom, um, adds a new layer. Uh, I'm not saying I like one more than the other. Um, they're different. And I, and what Bunny Kingdom adds is that spatial element on the board. Um, and of course a totally different way of actually scoring points, which, mm-hmm. um, which I really like. Um, uh, it's just, an, it's one of those games that's really easy to pull off the shelf. You know, we're, we've got three people. We're waiting for one more to come into the game day. Yeah. So, you know, he'll be here in a half hour. So let's play a round of Bunny Kingdom, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's quite a quick, um, set up, quick kind of take, take down kind of situation, isn't it? Um, and I, I like the bunny theme. Um, I think it's, it's cute and it's different. Um, I know, I know some people who are like a bunny game. I don't want to play a bunny game. And then I sort of convince them to play it and they're like, actually, this is a lot of fun. <laughs> and then there's other people who are like, it's a bunny game. Let's play, you know. <laughs> and they're the ones that like get like kind of 50 minutes into the game and you can see them. They're kind of trying a little bit because it's been really, really tough for them to play it. It's, <laughs> it's one of these games so that I, I, had, yeah. I, have a, I have a friend who buys, who collects a lot of games. Um, yeah. Uh, great guy. And he, uh, we explained, we explained that it's a bunny game to him, and that it's drafting, and that it's good. And he was like, "I don't want to play a bunny game." And we're like, "Come on, give it a try." And he's, he's like, "Okay, fine." And one turn in, we were at, we were at a convention, and one turn in, he's like, "Is this the dealer room still have copies of this?" <laughs> <laughs> I want to buy a copy. <laughs> you know, well, yeah, he immediately I mean... saw the interesting decisions, and the fact that it was about bunnies no longer mattered. So. No, I don't think. Yeah, I think you get to that point where it's, but there's lots of little components on it. It's kind of a. It has lots of little bunnies. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, what's not to, what's not to like, what's not to like about that? You know, um, is there anything that you have that you know is going to kind of coming out or is going to be appearing in the next couple of months um, that you thought, well, I need to get my hands and play a couple of rounds of of that game. Um, I would really like to play a fistful of stars. Um, All right, okay. Uh, if you're familiar with that one, it's the it's the space version of a few acres of snow. So All right, I was, okay. I was intrigued to give that a try. Um, I mean, so I you know we could we could go down the list of the twelve hundred games that are coming out at Essen, and you know, <laughs> I know because at least a hundred of them are games I'd love to try. Right, at least probably more like five hundred of them. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's kind of. Do you have quite a large collection yourself, or do you kind of control what you're kind of bringing in? Because I have, I have the benefit of, again, being in LA and having yeah. a lot of friends who have really large collections. <laughs> right. Um, so, uh, uh, I'm, I'm also on the minimalist end of the spectrum, probably. So I don't have a massive collection, um, which is due partly to <laughs> not living in a huge apartment um, yeah. and sort of having minimalist inclinations and then also knowing that any of the really hot big games that come out um, at least one of the people I know and game with regularly is going to buy it. Yeah. Um, so so for example um, Seventh Continent, right? Oh. Um, you know, I would love to give that game a try. I haven't tried it yet. I could have backed the Kickstarter. I opted not to because I already know three friends who own it, right? <laughs> um, the point, yeah. Exactly. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, okay. And where did you? Um, I mean, you're sitting there. You're being kind of on the designing side of things, and you're playing. So, when do you decide to actually sit? There? I mean, you've obviously been designing, you know, games since you're nine, and I definitely want a picture of that arnica so I can put it on the show notes. But <laughs> when do you move from going to, you know? Did you start off on a career, down a career path, and then went right? Let's see where this the board design, board game design thing can go. Or were you kind of constantly kind of have you just been constantly kind of up in your game and kind of building up and more and more in games? I mean, how did you move from being somebody who was using coloring pencils to being somebody who's doing something like say Mystic Veil? Vale? I mean, how did that come about? Yeah, so I never saw 
it as a choice between games or a different career. Uh-huh. I always I always figured I could pursue a practical, um, steady career yeah. while doing game design on the side or one of the other um, sort of creative endeavors I enjoy. Uh, uh-huh. Game design was the first one I decided to really try to pursue, mm-hmm. um, and it ended up being successful. Um, and now it's turned into more work that I can than I can do without going at least part time at my day job. So that's so I have done that. Yeah. Um, but I, I I went I went to school for economics, um, which okay. um, got a job straight out of school in that field. Um, I've been working in uh, marketing mixed modeling for almost five years now. Okay. Um, so, uh, I've been able to pursue sort of the practical career while also doing game design on the side. Um, yeah. uh, the card crafting system, which I came up with originally in Edge of Darkness, and then I sold that game to AEG back in January 2015. Um, later I designed Mystic Veil vale and sold that one, um, and... Um, with the handful of successes I've had lately, I've been able to do um, part-time at my my practical job and um, been doing game design full-time for about a year now. Um, yeah. So I you I answered your question? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's, it's, it's your no answer. Rambling. <laughs> your, your, no, rambling's fine. It's your night, as I said. There isn't any questions. You know, as I say, if you go down to question 17 of the show notes... Which there aren't any because I didn't send you any because <laughs> we don't bother with show notes. As I say, it's just like a little conversation. So are you? I mean, are you more like the um, the kind of the John Gilmore kind of game design thing? Is that you design the games and then you will look at companies to kind of make the games and take it to the next stage? Because you said that about Edge of Darkness. You said that about kind of Mystic Veil. Vale. Or are you? You know. Would you see things through to the actual kind of end the production? You know, like a, a kind of like a James Hudson or someone like that that kind of puts the game together and then kind of puts it through kind of the Kickstarter model or the publishing model. Or are you just kind of like, here's my idea, who'd like to have it, and then hand it over to somebody else and let them kind of deal with it? Do you do you stay quite hands on through the process? I. <laughs> always thought self-publishing was something I might choose to do, but never was something I wanted to try to do first. Yeah. Um, my first direction I wanted to go was to try to design games and then see if I could successfully pitch them to publishers and, uh-huh. and see if publishers would be up for licensing them and publishing them um, uh-huh. so that I could continue just doing, um, just doing the game design part. Um, okay. So that was the route I took, and it and it has worked out. Um, how much am I involved after I sell it to the publisher has completely depended on the publisher. I like being involved uh-huh. in the game. Um, I, I usually am continuing to have ideas for improving the game. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, so AEG, for example, has been super receptive. Right, I, I work very closely with them. Yeah, we're yeah. still we're still developing Edge of Darkness. Um, it's uh-huh. the game. The game is essentially done, but um, I'm still working with them. Um, minor tweaks, uh, new cards. Um, so I like being involved in that whole development end. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't like. Um, it's not so much that I don't like the publishing end. I would I would consider self publishing at some point um, if if it made sense to. Yeah. But as long as just designing games and getting them picked up by publishers was working um, happy to do that because mm-hmm. there's um, there seems to be a bit of a pressure on someone that a game designer should almost be taking everything to fruition and I think Kickstarter has kind of because it's so popular it's almost kind of given people that kind of that route this is the route that you should go which is why you see an awful lot of kind of like first for every guy that you see that's done their, on their 10th or their 13th campaign on Kickstarter, there's a lot of guys that they're just kind of publishing for the kind of the, for the first for the kind of the first time. So when you say <clears throat> when you say self-publishing might be something you would do, is that just something that is a kind of thing? Well, mm, 
not sure if I'd really want to actually do it because it's, I mean, that's a whole new skill set to learn. I mean, there's a massive difference between getting a design from, I guess, a prototype stage to getting it kind of designed to getting it made to then go and marketing it to getting it all kind of made up in, in kind of the, um, the Kickstarter side of things or getting it kind of published side of things. Um, yeah, absolutely. So. Yeah, I mean, I think the other big hurdle as a as an independent uh, publisher or someone doing your first game ever, the big hurdles are a knowledge gap of how to do it, right? But if, if yeah. you sort of have the the confidence in your game and the and the drive to do it, um, you can cover that gap yourself, right? And it's not huh. um, it's it's just a matter of how hard you want to work, right? Um, okay. The the I think the other gap is financial, right? Um, and that was that's a real block for a lot of people up until Kickstarter existed. And I think the fact that that financial gap can be covered by running a Kickstarter campaign um, and takes a lot of that risk up front makes makes for this explosion in indie games that we're seeing from small publishers, which is which is great, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just allowed a lot of people to um, to go from absolutely nowhere to actually taking taking a game and and actually making something of it. There still is, though, <clears throat> sorry, from my experience, there's still, um, and the designers that I speak to, there's a lot of pressure to, you end up putting a lot of money into almost creating kind of like a fully fledged kind of product yourself before you put it on Kickstarter. I mean, there's a lot of games that I've seen on Kickstarter which are pretty much they are good to go, you know, they're ready to get filed and the file sent to the printers and they can get made because the designer has spent the time kind of getting the components kind of put together as well. Um, is that kind of pressure off when you're just designing? Are you able to give the ideas of how the mechanics will work? Do you put a lot of work into the kind of the prototypes yourself or would you I mean is that something you would work with the AG you would take the idea of you know, you take the idea of the game to them and say, well, this is the mechanics and this is a kind of an idea to the artwork and then would they go away and get the artist for you to kind of pick the kind of the look and feel of the game kind of thing? Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, the long, <laughs> the long, the longer answer is it's, it's really, a, with, with AEG in particular, it's, it's uh-huh. really a matter of how much I want to be involved. Yeah. Um, they, they're very open to listening to suggestions from me. Obviously, they're the ones footing the bill. So yeah. they get, they get the final call, right? If I say, no, I really think this is the art style we should go. And they're like, actually, <laughs> you know, everyone over here disagrees with you, John. Um, right. I, <laughs> I could either put my foot down and say, well, then you don't get to publish my game. Right. Um, or yeah. they get the, fi- or they get the final say. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, but so, you, don't want, you don't want to take the kind of the guy that's got the check. No, I don't want your check. I'm going yeah, somewhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm going to see you later. <laughs> kind of thing. Um, it- <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So the, the advantage of, of not being the publisher is I don't, I don't have to worry about connecting with artists and all that communication stuff. I don't have to worry about the manufacturing side. Yeah. Um, I just sort of get to say what I do- like and don't like uh-huh. about the art, and then they either take take me take my suggestions or not. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I am, I do consider myself largely responsible for the game being fun outside of the look and feel, right? Yeah. Um, uh, or really just the look, right? Um, so, uh, my main focus, of course, is always on, is on the gameplay itself. Okay. Okay. Um, with, I mean, let's talk about the, um, the elephant in the room. Let's talk about Downfall, because, um... It's on Kickstarter just now. Do you want to tell people? Because people are obviously going to say, "Right, that's this is great." Once again, Richard, you've spent thirty-five minutes talking nothing about the reason that you're probably the episode title, which is going to be, <laughs> which is which is going to have downfall on it. And folk are going to start listening and going, "Okay, when do we start talking about downfall?" Do you want to explain a little bit about downfall, what it's about, and and things like that? So the, you know, because we don't want the flaming torches and pitchforks at my door again <laughs> <laughs> not again not again exactly you know um yeah yeah of course um so down of of all the games i've designed downfall was the one that was most designed with my gaming tastes in mind so i i sort of set out to design 
my favorite style game. Um, uh, and that, that's not to say I don't really enjoy Mystic Veil, right, or Edge of Darkness. Um, uh, but specifically 4X style games is usually my favorite type of game. Mm-hmm. So um, Dudes on a Map were... Well, it's an epic, longer game, plays with a big player count. Um, we're competing for territories. Uh, we're advancing civilization. There's this sort of story arc and progression. Um, all of that um, is is my favorite style of game. Mm-hmm. So Downfall I designed with, you know, with that goal in mind. Um, sometimes I start my design efforts with a mechanic in mind. Yeah. Um, uh, that's probably usually how I design, is I start with mechanics and then try to find a theme that makes sense. Okay. Downfall, Downfall started um, with a style of game in mind. So I want it to make a 4X big yeah. Civ game, right? And I want it to... I did, uh, one of my least favorite thing about those kind of games is just sort of dice-chucking luck. Um, so I wanted to... <laughs> Sounds uh, like a swear word. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I wanted to I wanted to take the random parts out, right? I, yeah. I always found it a very unsatisfying moment in in games like Twilight Imperium where you, you know, you have a particular objective, you've spent the last round or two rounds planning for it, you um, you execute it, you send your ships, you have a, like, 80% chance of winning, and then you fail, right? Uh, and it's just a... And it's like, oh, okay, um, you know, that was two hours of the game time that, you know, was squandered because of... Um, bad dice rolling, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I don't, I don't mind doing bad in games, but I want to feel like it's my fault, not right. You know what I mean? Like, I want to be like, oh, I should have done that, as opposed to I did everything exactly the way I should have done it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Only to so, be so I want to take down, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. I want to take that element out. Um, um, but otherwise, still have that big f- epic feel. Um, okay. Downfall started as a like a Roman era um, Civ game. Yeah. Um, okay. And and in in the design process, I wanted to, I specifically just decided to try to differentiate it from other 4x games. Yeah. Um. In in multiple ways, and one of the ways I was I decided would be a good way to do it was with theme. Um. So I I instead pushed into the future and made it post-apocalyptic. So we're still set on Earth or an Earth-like place. Yeah. Um. So it's a it's a map. Board. It's not. We're not. It's not Twilight Imperium. We're not in. You know. There's not planets. Um, it's all on Earth. Um, but it's post-apocalyptic. So um, the apocalypse just happened, right? And and the Earth's population is decimated. All that's left are bands of survivors, right? Who are now attempting to rebuild civilization from the ashes, right? But we're. But what really comes across in the game is is it's not just Oh, we're post-apocalyptic, so now let's build civilization, um, which is just analogous to building it from scratch back in the Stone Age, right? Um, it actually, the, the the challenges of a post-apocalyptic future come through in the mechanics. So um, there's uh, radiation fallout that is spreading across the globe, yeah. um, and players have to continually contend with that radiation encroaching upon the borders of their territory and have to deal with it and try to and try to clean it up and prevent it from from killing their people right um, your food and your resources will spoil um, and resources in the game are not abundant so you have to store your resources um, all right okay tra- exploring the map you find resources but but once you use them they're gone unless you do um, a very particular action which is not very efficient unless you build certain buildings, right? Um, so resources in the game are particularly scarce and hard to come by, because, um, again, we're in the future, right? We're in the post-apocalyptic future. Um, and then the other big element of the game is you have to feed your people, right? And, it, and um, you know, if you don't feed your people, they will they will die. Right? Yeah. Um, so the feel of down... So I, I, I think I successfully managed making the feel of downfall um, and some of the challenges you face in the game quite different than a lot of other 4X games. Um, so in a lot of 4X style games, which again, I really enjoy, um, you, you build up your civilization and at some point you start running into borders with other people and, and you either get into battles with them so that you can fulfill objectives or so that you can conquer more territory, right? Yeah, um, yeah. It, 
so in, in Downfall, you, you, and, and, and then, so in those other games, right, and then eventually, you know, the game ends, um, after a handful of conflicts have happened, and, you know, we rack up points, right? So Downfall is a, is a somewhat different story arc to the game. The, the beginning is, is reminiscent, right, of, of that style, where you're expanding, you're building up, you're, you're getting technologies, you're sort of planning for the future. Um, but what you're planning for isn't so, isn't like an invasion into an opponent necessarily, or to fulfill particular objectives. You're actually planning to survive the second half of the game. So, right. so the game, the game has an event track in it that, um, that has certain events paced out during the game. And these events are things like Fallout, where the, the radiation will spread. Yeah. Or food allocation and, and spoilage, where your resources spoil and you have to feed your people. Um, so the, the events are primarily bad. Um, and they're paced out such that the first half of the game, there's a handful of them. Um, but, but they're not, they're not gonna you know, be all that terrible. But they ramp up and get much worse in the second half of the game and especially towards the end. Mm-hmm. So, uh, the first half of the game is very much about planning to survive the second half of the game. And okay. when you start having conflict in the game, it's usually not about, I am trying to take your territory because I want your territory. It's usually, you have food and I don't, right? So I need to come get your food because I've used up all mine and yeah. I don't have the actions to be able to generate more food right now. So my best way of feeding my people is going to be taking your food. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's the, that's the catalyst actually for a lot of battles in the game is, you know, well, my city is about to get blown up because radiation fallout is spreading and, you know, I'm out of, I'm out of the, the resources I need to clean it up. So I, I can either become nomadic and head to the center of the board where other people have some stuff because yeah, my yeah. home is going to blow up or I can try to stay here and fight it off, but it doesn't look good. So you know what? I'm coming, I'm coming because I got to leave my home, right? Um, and so the second half of the game plays out very differently than a lot of 4X games do. Um, and, and you spend the first half of the game planning for that. So it, it has a very different feel on the overall. Um, I think I, I think I skipped over what the core mechanic of the game is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I th- yeah, I think I was good. Cause I'm the, looking the, at, the, I'm looking at the pictures of the, all the board yeah. on the Kickstarter while you're, while you're talking. So the core um, mechanic of the game, the core <laughs> mechanic of the game is a, is what I call action drafting. Yeah. Everyone, everyone has a deck of action cards that, um, they start with at the end of the game, and your action cards are almost all the same as as other players. Your initial deck, um, but you have a you have a, f- a faction leader card in your deck that has a special unique power. Um, how it works is you're going to have a hand of four cards, uh, and each card represents a different action that you can do. So, for example, you could move. Um, or you could gather resources, or you could research a technology, or you could build buildings and construct airships and equip your survivors, um, or clean up radiation, right? So each card is an action you can do. And you have a four-card hand, and each turn, everybody will simultaneously choose one of their four cards and place it face down on the table. And then, yeah. they'll, pa- then they'll pass their other three cards to the player on the left. Oh, right, okay. And once everyone's chosen their action card, everyone reveals their action card at the same time and then executes whatever that action was. Um, most of them execute on the board. Um, most of the time, everyone can just resolve simultaneously. Um, occasionally, people will have to go in turn order, which is then indicated by an initiative number on the card they chose. So, mm-hmm. for example, if me and the person to my right both played a movement action, him and I would want to go in initiative order, right? Whereas everybody yeah. else who just gathered and built and researched, um, they can just sort of do their things first, and then we go in movement order. So most of the time, everyone just goes at the same time, so the pace of the game is really fast, even with even with the full complement of six players. You have, a, you have a game that plays really quick. There's not really a lot of downtime in the game. Mm-hmm. Um, so once everyone's done their action, you then take the three cards that were passed to you, you draw the top card of your deck, and then you repeat the process. Um, and there's a couple caveats to that. In everyone's draw deck, uh, there's a couple car- a couple winter cards. Um, winter cards are when you draw it, you immediately discard it and then redraw a new card. And then for every winter card that's drawn each turn, the event track advances one space. 
Oh, right. So right. that okay. sort of that sort yeah. of dictates the pacing of the game. When you get to the end of the event track, the game's over. Um, and as you as you go along the event track, different events will occur. So you uh-huh. so players can see what event is coming. We, we it's not like you randomly get hit by something. You you know what the next event is. You mm-hmm. don't know exactly when it's going to happen because it's going to depend on the card draw. You you can you can sort of guesstimate. I think it's probably going to happen within one to three turns, right? Um, but you don't you don't know for sure. So that advances the event track, and then certain events will occur, and we have to deal with them. Um, moreover, everyone has a two-card reserve. So when you when you choose when you're choosing a card to play each turn, yeah. you can play one of your two cards from your reserve instead of from your hand. Okay. And then what you would do is one of the, you would take one of the four cards from your hand and put it in your reserve to replace the card that you played. So you always have two cards. You always have two cards in your reserve. One card you're playing and three cards yeah. you're passing. Um, is that to kind of is that to kind of avoid the situation where you do get in a lot of these card drafting games, I'm thinking terraforming Mars, I'm thinking about you, where you can end up with a card you're just like, I can't do anything with this at all. So it's good to have kind of something in the background that you can go, actually I can do this. Yeah, instead, yeah. Exactly. So you can always so good players in Downfall will be using the reserve sixty percent of the time. Sixty to eighty percent of the time they'll be playing a card out of their reserve, right? Because your reserve allows you to pace out the plan and pace out the actions you want, right? So the sequence of actions you do often really matters, right? You know, I want to gather resources, then I want to play a build action, right? And then once I've built things like airships, I would like to move and explore with them, right? So I want to do these actions in this sequence, but because it's a draft, there's no guarantee you'll each hand you'll get the cards in that sequence that you want. But you can use your reserve to plan it, right? So um, if I've planned where I have, okay, I have a gather in this hand, I have a movement in my deck. All right, as long as I get uh, a build on the next draw, I can do it in sequence, right? Um, so you're always planning multiple turns in advance using that reserve, and it gives you a lot more control. Um, uh, so you, you're you usually not screwed by the draft. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, you know... You know um, you might not have planned it out right, and that's what leaves you with nothing. Yeah. Um, every every now and then, of course, you know, everyone shuffled all of one particular action to the bottom of their deck, right? So um, that one's a, that particular action becomes a little scarce. Um, every card has a minor action on it, which is sort of a lame version of one of the regular actions. So if you're really tight and you really need to do a particular thing, you can usually use a, a minor action to do it, and it just won't be as efficient. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's I mean that's a that's a decent overview of what to expect in the game. Um, and you do you reveal when you're going out? Are you turning over the tiles as you go out in there as well? So yeah. it's kind of a little bit random, but the fact is that that affects everybody that's on the board as opposed to as you said, kind of avoiding the the horrors of this random dice that could probably really wreck a kind of wreck a player's chances. If it's a bad tile, then it's going to affect everybody particularly, instead of potentially affecting kind of kind of one player instead. So um, probably, so so what you're saying there is is, is actually um, probably the most the most random and luck hmm. um, driven part of the game is is everyone starts with four hexagon spaces as their opening territory. Yeah. Um, and actually, in this game, each hexagon space um, can be multiple spaces. Yeah. Um, so it's not actually a hexagon map um, because one hexagon may have one to three spaces on it. Um, so uh, you're not always moving in a hex grid. You're. Um, it, it's not quite. Doesn't end up actually working that way. Uh, okay. But you start with you start with that territory, and everything else on the board is unexplored at the start of the game. Yeah. Um, and as you explore, um, as you move into an unexplored space, it reveals, um, and then you can now use that territory. Okay. Um, and and that was a that was an interesting design choice for me. Um, I I recognize that there's a random certain you know some spaces are better than others, right? Um, I find that it's more interesting if some spaces are better than others, but it also means, you know, one player might get. A couple bad, a couple not as good spaces. There's usually there's no spaces in the game where like you move into it and oh it's terrible you die right. Um, yeah, yeah. All spaces have something useful <laughs> mm-hmm. um, uh, that you can find. Um, but 
you know, maybe you're like, I really, I'm, I'm, I don't have any territory with this particular type of resource. I would really like to f- explore and find one, and maybe you don't find one, right? Um, so you might have to research a technology that allows you to convert resources instead, right? Um, yeah. So, there, so the, that's probably the biggest aspect of luck in the game is the exploration part. Yeah. Um, but but, then- but at the same time, the reason I kept it in was because it's a lot of fun, right? Like <laughs> the. Yeah. Uh, I, talking with playtesters, I really enjoy the, it, and and it's one of those things where it's not like you move in and you get randomly screwed, right? You you actually want to use your early game exploration to scout out the territories around you, which then inform your decisions of where should you be moving later, right? Um, so you're not stuck with what you get so much. Um, uh, you want to scout out what's near you early, usually, and then use that new information you got from exploring the nearby territories to determine the direction in which you want to expand your civilization. Yeah, no, I think you know, random randomness is good in certain things as long as it you know, it kind of balances out. I think I have more of an issue with randomness when it's kind of like, maybe at the, a roll of a dice when it's affecting one player and that's it and they can be kind of completely um I guess com- made completely inert by their dice roll, they become completely kind of um, kind of powerless because of that. I, yeah, um, yeah. I think my least favorite type of luck is when it feels like you have no control over it. So, yeah. so if you if you know what the risk is you're taking, um, and then you you try choose to take it anyway, um, uh, or or something random happens and then you have a choice to make based on that yeah. random what happens as opposed to um, just you know randomly getting dealt a bad hand right well I'm getting I'm getting um, feelings of the old uh, real time strategy games year old kind of command and conquer and even June from years and years ago where you would have the map you would know what was on there and it was your job to kind of go ahead and explore the map and see what came up in terms of resources or um, challenges and stuff like that. So that's kind of it's kind of interesting to me. That um, was Age of Empires for me. Yeah, I played a lot yeah. of Age of Empires. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, there you go. Yeah, yeah. How long is it going to take for a game? I mean, um, when I've spoken to people that have talked about other. Um, 4X games, you know, your eclipses of this world and things like that, they've been sitting down for kind of like hours at a time and for some people that's fine but for some people if they have a game night sitting up until 3 o'clock in the morning isn't the most attractive thing <laughs> for them to do. So what's the kind of the playtime going to be like on, on Downfall? Yeah, so Downfall is definitely a main event type of game it's not okay. a, you know what do we want to play now? Oh, let's play a quick game of Downfall, right? Um, yeah. Uh, it plays three to six players, hmm. um, and uh, the the difference in length isn't between the number of players isn't huge because of the the fact that everyone resolves simultaneously their, yeah. their their actions. So the three player game isn't all that much shorter than the six player game. Mm-hmm. Um, there's definitely it definitely does play shorter, but um, it's not uh, like a one to one relationship. Okay. The gameplay, um, your first game is going to be probably longer than three hours. Um, That's perfectly acceptable. Yeah. So, <laughs> so depending on your group, I mean, I've played, I have played a five-hour game of Downfall with a slow group of six people, um, but I've also, I've also played an hour and a half long game with a fast group. Yeah. Um, so, so neither of those cases is exemplary of what you should reasonably expect. Um, no. Probably two and a half is going to be the average game length, which isn't bad because I mean, if you're looking at, you know, size games like that, I mean, that's you know, you can if you're taking your, you know, if you're kind of sitting down, relaxing, enjoying, taking your time, you know, your average game is going to take of this, you know, similar ilk is going to take around about two and a half hours. It's when a game is let's break for lunch kind of thing. That's kind of you know, I don't know if I've got the concentration to sit down for a. Seven or eight hour game, I'd probably get <laughs> bored, and they would find me kind of so, <laughs> kind of wandering off, kind of thing. I actually really enjoy super long games. Um, I don't mind a seven or eight hour game um, now and then. Uh, Downfall used to be earlier in the design process was um, was more like a four four hour average length 
game. Yeah. Um, and I actually really enjoyed that version of the game, but that was back before anybody knew my name. Like that was that was before Mystic Veil vale or Edge of Darkness, right? Really? Um, All right. Uh, and um, I, I made the choice to um, do some things that would shorten the length of the game mm-hmm. in order to get it more in a range that I felt would likely would more likely get picked up by a publisher. So, so I yeah, actually made that yeah. choice to make the game more accessible for for publishers. Um, it's a kind of hard sell, and it, Downfall, honestly, Downfall was a hard sell to begin with. Um, as a as sort of a no name designer, you know, um, you, you you imagine imagine pitching a game like Downfall, which comes in this big box. There's a bazillion components, um, and I say, you know, this is a this is a four X game that plays three to six players in you know two and a half to four hours. Right. I thought, and, yeah. and and publishers look at you and they're like, Great. Um, you know, sorry, thanks. it's too big it's too big for us, right? Thanks. We don't know thanks who you for... are and exactly. we don't have time to try this because there's a million other great games we want to look at also. Exactly. Thanks for dropping by um, yeah. um John John, isn't it? Is it John? Yeah, John, leave your card at the desk and yeah. Uh, yeah. and uh, we will probably put it in the bin. Um so that's actually I mean that that that's that's more or less what I got with Downfall. Um I pitched yeah. it I pitched it to a bunch of publishers. Um, mm-hmm. um I only ever played it so you know the, the the goal of pitching to publishers is to get them to actually sit down and play your game because then then you don't have to explain to them why it's good, right? Yeah. It speaks for itself. Um they don't have to believe you anymore, right? Um so I actually I was I pitched it to a whole bunch of publishers. Most of them I made a really nice looking prototype, right? I, I usually try to do that when I'm pitching games. Um, and most publishers, I, when I explain the mechanics to them, they're like, "This sounds really interesting, but you know, it's it's too big for us. Um, uh, so we'll, we're going to have to pass." Um, yeah. The only the only two people who ever played it um, was uh, Queen Games, and it and the person who actually makes the decisions about what to publish wasn't the one who played it. Um, oh, right. a, a person who then recommended me to that person played it. She, she really liked it, um, and she thought, um, uh, Queen, it might be something that the, the decision makers of what games to publish at Queen Games would do, but, um, he, he also said, you know, this looks too big for us, um, and didn't get a chance to play it. And then the only other publisher that actually played it was Tasty Minstrel, and, um, they, they played it back to back nights with me at Board Game Geek Convention. Um, and then the day after the convention, they were like, "Yeah, we really like this game. We want to publish it." <laughs> is it difficult? I mean, is it, is it difficult? Well, it must be difficult pitching. I mean, you're almost like in a dragon's den type situation because, in terms and the difference of a Kickstarter, you are generally expected to have kind of like reviews done and videos done and kind of playthroughs done. Whereas for you, the pitch must be an awful lot harder because you're not, you can't refer. You can't really refer somebody to YouTube, can you? Because it's kind of like I kind of need to kind of keep maybe some of the mechanics hidden. You're needing to protect your IP, but at the same time, you kind of want to demonstrate it to people at the same time. So you're not you're not going in with maybe half the collateral that usually a a Kickstarter campaign would would kind of have, I guess. So that must make it difficult. Do you approach it kind of like? I mean, do you send? Do you end up sending out a lot of letters all the time? I mean, is half your job kind of constantly on the kind of the pitch and having business meetings with people and doing the convention circuits and stuff like that as well? So, uh, I actually do a lot less pitching to publishers now. Um, mm. but it's been virtually none for the last year. I've been working pretty closely with AEG. Uh-huh. Um, uh, I'm designing a spec- I'm designing a handful of games specifically for them. Okay. Um, so, so I'm not on the the, the path of pitching games lately. Um, but okay. I actually really enjoyed pitching games when I did, um, yeah. especially when I felt really confident about the game. Um, so, um, you know, Edge of Darkness was a great example of um, me enjoying pitching because um, I knew I had something really cool there, right? Um, yeah. With the card crafting mechanic, um, like I knew. I felt really confident um, about that game, and about the fact that people would be interested, and and that and that played out right. Um, virtually every person I pitched it to either said yes, we're interested, or 
wow, that's a cool idea, but I, you know, we don't know how to make that game. Okay. Um, because the the plastic cards and stuff, right? Um, yeah. So when you're pitching, when you're pitching to people, do you send them like the rule book and some basic kind of mechanics and some artwork and stuff like that, or do you? Um, I mean, or do you kind of just go around and arrange a meeting with a copy of the game under your arm? It's both. Um, mm. the, the, what I found the most success with was messaging publishers in advance of a game convention, asking them if they would have any representatives at mm-hmm. that game convention that were looking at prototypes, mm-hmm. and, and then getting who those names were, and, and even better, uh, a time to actually stop by and pitch the games to them. Yeah. Um, uh, to make that successful, I would make sell sheets, and I would usually try to make really nice looking sell sheets of yeah. really nice looking prototypes. So I'd get, um, you know, I'd, I'd spend some time on the graphic design and make it look good. Um, yeah. And then in advance, I'd message the publishers, ideally set up some meetings to show them, and then um, and then go to the convention and you know try to execute on those pitches. Um, <laughs> that's that's how. Downfall got picked up by Tasty Minstrel Games. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I knew them in advance. I set up the meeting before the the um, the convention, and then had a chance to actually play it with them. Yeah. That was at Board Game Geek Convention, which the advantage there is um, it's a good convention for actually sitting down and playing the games with the publishers. Okay. Um, it's is also it cool? uh, yeah. No, so, sorry. Go ahead. No. What were you gonna I say? was just going to say that that was also the way I got Edge of Darkness picked up. From by AEG was messaged a handful of publishers in advance again of Board Game Geek convention. This was the year after I sold Downfall, um, uh, and set up appointments with them. Sat down, actually got to play the game, um, uh, and yeah, that that was a fun convention because just the response to that particular game was um, strong. And you know, as a as at the time a, a no name designer who was still looking for his you know first break yeah um i I had, I had sold downfall at the time um but it hadn't come out yet um so you know it was fun to see all of these publishers be like wow this is really cool you know <laughs> yeah i mean is that a, is that an actual is that a real buzz is to, to actually not not just have somebody going oh this game looks cool online but actually sitting down with someone in front of you for the first time and seeing them the little kind of flash in their eyes as they get the game and they start to move from, you know, consciously try to learn the rules to actually settling in and really enjoying it. I mean, is that a real reward to kind of like be doing the pitching side of things to see somebody's kind of like going, yeah, this is fun, and not only them going from this is fun to, oh my goodness, we could actually sell this game and it would be, you know, it would do really, really well. Is that kind of, is it, is it kind of cool when you kind of see that it must be? So the, the the whole first half of that is is just design process in general. Um, yeah, it is very satisfying to spend a long time working on a game, build mm-hmm. a nice prototype, develop it over a while, and and just those times when you sit down with a bunch of um, bunch of people and watch them play your game and watch them have a great time, you know, um, and uh, that's satisfying. And then yeah, I mean, the, pitching to a publisher and watching a publisher who you who you know is a uh, good publisher and could do a great job with your game also sitting down and really having a good time with it and that's a good right you know and like thinking okay this could this could work you know uh-huh. I might uh-huh. I might have a I might have a bite here um, yeah it's a good it's a good feeling that's cool that's cool um the you mentioned that you earlier on that you you haven't had much dealings with the the new downfall you kind of the downfall Kickstarter did you have any? Was the deluxified idea? Was that something that you brought in, or was that something that was brought in by TMG? TMG suggested it um, a while back, um, and I was. Uh, my response was at this point they'd had the game for a year and a, almost two years, uh-huh. um, and my response was, "Yeah, deluxified sounds great as long as it doesn't delay the game being mm-hmm. released too much." Um, they they thought it would delay it, um, and then it got delayed anyway. So a year later, it still hadn't come out. They still hadn't mm-hmm. had the it ready to go. So mm-hmm. I told them, you know what? And, and 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 a year later, at that point, Mystic Veil had come out, 
Um, so I wasn't sort of anxiously waiting for my first game to really come out yet. No. Um, so af- at that point, I was like, you know what, TMG guys, if um, if it's going to take an extra year or year and a half to make this deluxified, yeah. um, that's fine. Right? You know, I, I'm not as anxious to see this game get out there yet. I still, you know, of course I'm excited to see it get out there. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, I'm happy to wait to get the the better version of the game out there, or the the nicer, components wise version of the game out there. Okay. And do you have a copy of the deluxified version then? I don't yet. Oh, I will. What? I will. I will. But I, I I don't. I don't think anybody has a copy of the deluxified version yet. We don't know what. You it's going to depend on. Looks like. It's going to yeah. depend on what all the stretch goals end up being. Um, I suppose. Uh, TMG has a handful of copies of. Um, you know, a prototype version of the game with just you know cardboard bits, but um, that must be yeah, exciting. I haven't I haven't got to play with that one yet either. Oh man! But then I suppose I was when I was speaking to John Gilmore, he was talking exactly the same thing when he was uh, he was talking about a couple of games he was involved in. It's like, well, I haven't I haven't played the game because I'm waiting to get the final version of the game like everybody else is because. Um, I do occasionally get copies, but usually I'm waiting for the first production run, and I get sent one maybe before a couple of weeks before everybody else. Yep. But I'm still kind of waiting to, to kind of uh, I'm waiting for that kind of that that kind of the ring on the doorbell with a postman with a lovely kind of big box of goodness. Yep. Oh, um, I mean, it was super exciting when I got Mystic Veil vale for the first time. Yeah. Um, which was, what was that? It was maybe a month and a half before it was released. Maybe, maybe only a month. <laughs> um, so I got—I mean, I got my final production copy uh, to one, one or two copies of it, um, like a month before it came out. Right? That was awesome to get. Um, yeah. You know? So. <laughs> and Mystic Veils went on to be—I mean, there's a lot of people that have a lot of love for Mystic Veil out there. You know, it's—it's um, it's kind of—it's a well, well liked. Um, and well played game, you know. People have a lot of lot of nice things to to kind of say about that. Is that kind of cool seeing that when you know when you're out there and do you do you hang? Are you the type of person that kind of goes and jumps onto the Mystic Veil vale kind of board on Board Game Geek to see what kind of people have been saying about the game or help out with questions or? Um, I, I didn't I didn't used to. I've decided I, I wanted to stay away from that, but I, I've decided. Um, more recently that um, I do want to try to be involved in responding to comments if people have questions about especially about gameplay but yeah. um, other stuff um, so yeah I've reviewed I've re- you know um, I've looked at comments I've responded to stuff um, I've watched reviews of the game it's uh, listening to positive reviews is very satisfying I mean for example Tom Vassell gave it a gave it a stellar review he loved yeah, it to, yeah Tom um, Vassell so Tom Vassell went it yeah you love that. That's super <laughs> satisfying. Um, yeah, I think I've I've heard this from other people, um, creative creators. Um, it's the negative comments. One negative comment sticks with you as much as thirty positive comments, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> uh, so there's always those few comments where the guys like, you know, this is the dumbest game of the year. You know, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, this is just a stupid gimmick. You know, with no real gameplay. You know. And then the next, and then the next three comments are like, "This is my favorite game of the year," but it's like that negative comment that you know. The sarcasm out, but. one. <laughs> but then you know you're you're not tempted to reply. Oh, I'm still working full time in your job. Um, kind of, you know. Oh, I'm just you know part time now. <laughs> no, I think <laughs> so. Uh, un- un- if it's if it's a totally unconstructive negative comment, um, I think the best response is just to ignore it. Yeah. Um, if it's a constructive negative comment with sort of a, I don't know why they made this decision. This I didn't like this part of the game, and I'm not sure why they didn't do it this way. Yeah. Um, type of thing that I might I might respond if I have a good response to it. Yeah. Um, I don't I don't I mean I don't expect everyone to like all of my games, right? I mean, I, you know, you can have great taste in board games and also not like a couple of my games, right? Um, uh, so that, <laughs> you say, that's fine. You said like you're saying that through gritted teeth. That's, <laughs> no, no, that's no, fine. I mean, you that's, you keep your board game taste. That's okay. I don't uh, care. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, but no. I mean, it is. I mean, it's. I, I, do you know? I think 
the worst thing about being in that situation is the game's out there and it's not like you can say, do you know what, you're right, let's recall all, you know, 47,362 copies that have gone out there and just change it just for you and then we'll send it back out again. You're kind of stuck going, well, I don't know. I mean, I've seen games that have um, made changes to stuff using kind of expansions and stuff like that. Um, And try to... I guess there's obvious kind of changes you can make to some games. I I was um, listening to um, a podcast today that we're talking about Battlestar Galactica and they say they've they've played the game with all the expansions but then they've gone back to playing the game without the expansions just to get the kind of the pure vanilla feel of the game because sometimes kind of the expansions and slight errata and changes in the rules kind of have taken away from kind of what they liked about the game. Kind of like in in the first place, you've um you've got expansions for Mystic Veil, vale. is that right? Yeah, the third one is actually I think on sale for the first time this week at Essen. Oh, okay. It's going to be the third small box expansion. So that's the third expansion for Mystic Veil vale available at Essen. If you're listening <laughs> just now, <laughs> is that going to be is that going to be at the is there going to be a stand there that people can go? AEG has a booth there, yeah. Yeah, okay, so that's AEG. You'll be able to find it if you <laughs> yeah, and pick up the game because will you be? They'll probably be selling Mystic Veil there as well. Oh yeah, of course, of course. So go to Essen. In fact, just go to Germany. Yeah, just fly, now. fly to Germany. Fly to Germany. <laughs> get, get your tickets so that you get can Mystic buy Vail. a copy of Mystic Veil. <laughs> make John, make John very happy. So when they report back and say, well. How did it go? And they say, Mystic Veil vale just sold out in seconds. I don't know if people kept talking about this weird Scottish guy doing his podcast. And then I felt strangely, <laughs> strangely kind of drawn to go Compelled, ahead and buy. Yeah. I was buying Mystic Veil. Vale. Have you not already got Mystic Veil? Vale? Yes, I have. I don't know. I just felt <laughs> to go out and buy another, and kind of buy another, another copy. I mean, in ter- for, for you kind of, um, kind of going, going for, I mean, is, um, are you kind of are you just going to see what happens with the downfall kind of campaign on Kickstarter? Or is that you kind of your design stuff is done? You're just waiting to see where it hits in terms of the stretch goals and stuff. Is there stretch goals out there which mean you'll have to jump in and help with the design stuff, or is that already being kind of taken care of? So I actually sent them, um, geez, like a year ago, a, a bunch of potential stretch goal content. Um, uh, which they may or may not use. I haven't seen any of it put up on Kickstarter yet. Okay. Um, uh, I, I'm mostly just monitoring it. Um, if people post comments that are specifically about gameplay, mm-hmm. um, I'll try to respond to them. Okay. Um, but I, I don't really have any, um, you know, I shouldn't be commenting and responding to people's questions about production or components and no, stuff, right? No. That's, that's in TMG's ballpark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. And what's next for you now? I mean, are you? I mean, are you looking at Bunny Kingdom and saying, "Right, I'm gonna do, um, I'm gonna do Squirrel Valley. That's my next game." Or are you? Are you, you I like got... that name. That's a good name. Squirrel Valley. Squirrel Valley. The battle for the nuts. Yeah, yeah, that's good. <laughs> I like that. All right, you know maybe I mean? maybe uh, that maybe that'll be a game. I'll have to give you credit for it if that ends up being. It's a it's an area control game, and the idea is that you have the choice of taking over one square will get you one tree. If you take over maybe two squares, it gets you slightly bigger trees. But the danger is that obviously having more squares available for the trees means that you've got more chance of another squirrel landing on a space and potentially taking control of it because you've got to defend your area. On top of that, you've got the you got things to deal with, but there's a time scale on it because the game will last kind of maybe 10 rounds and the last four rounds will be based where it's getting colder to winter. So the number of nuts that are available will drastically reduce. You've also got predators to deal with depending on how you decide to move. You can move through the treetops if you want to, but you've got a danger of being attacked and taken down by owls. Or you can move along the ground where you've got a fox danger. There you go. You, there's you've, your clearly, game. you've clearly thought this out. <laughs> I just made that up on the spot. <laughs> You know, I should maybe try. Nah, I don't. Yeah, try your hand at game design. There you go. I don't want to do that. But what's next for yourself? I mean, as I say, you've you said you've got prototypes, kind of 
you sit down. I mean, are you have you got a take? You must have about fifteen games kind of sitting there. Do you just wake up in the middle of the night and go, "It's about you know kind of thing," and start writing stuff down, or have you got? Are you quite? Are you quite controlled in what you decide you're going to take forward? Because it doesn't sound like the games that you do are kind of just very quick, casually type stuff. You know, it sounds like there's a lot of thought and everything like that behind them. So it, it really depends. Um, specifically, what I've got next coming is Edge of Darkness. That's the mm. that's the big project on the horizon that I've got um, yeah. nearing its its conclusion. Mm-hmm. Um, so Edge of Darkness. Which is coming out from AEG. It's um, it was the first card crafting game I designed. It's yeah. sort of a medium weight Euro, um, sort of uh, richly thematic Euro, I would say. Uh-huh. Um, uh, that one's gonna be on Kickstarter in February. Um, All right, okay. And uh, we're hoping we're hoping that gets a big bump from Mystic Vale. Um, you know, uh, I know there's a, there's a handful of people who really like Mystic Vale and want to see more card crafting games, and yeah. then there's the handful of people who who um, Mystic Vale wasn't what they wanted, but they really liked the card crafting concept. Um, yeah, and this Edge of Darkness might might be more in their wheelhouse. Okay. okay. So well, so we'll hope that well. gives it a it gets a bump there. So that'll be on Kickstarter in February. That's the the big task that I've been working on. You know, working on the rulebook for that. Um, Working on some expansion content for it. Uh, Might need to get you back on. Might need to get you back on then. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, you do that. Um, uh, in terms of in terms of uh, game ideas and what I work on on a regular basis. Um, so you, it, you've it really got depends. Squirrel Game coming out. <laughs> yeah, so so you know, starting tomorrow, I'll be working on Squirrel Valley. Um, <laughs> uh, so it depends. It depends, right? So last um, or this week, I was actually building out prototypes for three different children's games that I've oh, had right. in my mind for a while. Yeah. Um, I want. I would like to. Um, I'd like to. I've had two of them are games. Actually, all three are games I've worked on in the past, um, and I'd, I'd like to package them all up um, and pitch them uh, to to some of the bigger publishers like Mattel. Um, and Hasbro uh, first, yeah. and then you know, likely I won't get any bites because you know it's hard to it's hard to get a yes from companies that big. Um, and then and then you know then I'll maybe pitch them to some of the smaller um, children's game publishers. Yeah. Um, last night, so so two weeks ago, I was at Vancouver at um, Shut Up and Sit Down's little oh yeah convention, yeah, yeah. The little yeah. The little convention they ran, um, which was great. Uh, and I was up there for we, we had a I got a um, Airbnb with a couple of the AEG guys and we were brainstorming game ideas and one of them sort of got my got my wheels spinning. Um, so like last night I was lying in bed awake for like an hour thinking of that game, right? Like <laughs> that and that happens on a regular basis. So <laughs> oh, no. um, so that might be something I will prototype out in the near future. Um, and you know those are the type of things where. You think about it for a while, it sounds good in your head, yeah. and you prototype it, and then, you know, 50% of it works. Yeah. Um, sometimes, sometimes 80% of it works, right? Yeah. Um, so I have a game, I have a game that's going to be out also from AEG in March, and this one's not being kickstarted, it's going straight to retail. A little dice game called, um, Space Base. Um, oh, okay. It'll, it'll remind you most of Machi Koro. Um, okay. and that was one of those games where I had the idea, um, I prototyped it in like a day because it was easy to make. Um, yeah. And then it was just great the first time I played it. I was like, wow, this is, you know, it's one of those, it was, it was one of those rare times where it sort of worked right out the gate. Um, it, was, it was, of course, not balanced. Um, so, uh, you know, over the next eight months or so, I kept working on it and designing it and tweaking it and yeah. rebalancing it. But it was one of those games where, okay, I don't, I don't need to make any major changes to this game right away this seems to be working pretty well um, uh-huh. and every now and then that happens all right okay okay um I'm conscious that I've taken up far too much of your time <laughs> <laughs> it's much later but, for you than it is for me it's middle no of the it's here, fine so. no it's fine no 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 I really I know I really appreciate all the time that you've given us today but um if people want to um keep an eye on you on the on the inter 
Web Nets. Where can we find you, Mr. Probably, John D. Probably the best way would be to follow me on Twitter. Okay. Uh, my Twitter my Twitter handle is just John D. Clare. Um no no spaces or dashes or anything, just just all one word, John D. Clare. Okay. Okay, cool. And what we'll do is we will put the links in the show notes regarding downfall. Great. Mystic Veil. Anything else? Anything else you want to give me over, we'll make sure that we put them in the show notes so that we have notes to show, as we say. Um Downfall looks from what you say, it sounds an awful lot of sounds like good fun. Um my kind of jam. So if you're into that thing then certainly go and check it out. Um if you want to keep an eye on what we're up to, go to Google, search for We're Not Wizards, you'll find us on well you'll find our website, we're not wizards dot com. We've got Twitter as well, We're Not Wizards. Guess what? YouTube, We're Not Wizards Tabletop Podcast, we're there as well. Um You'll find us on all the normal podcast catchers. So you've got Stitcher and Speaker and Acast. There's a lovely one called Podknife who are up and coming and growing and are worthwhile kind of looking at. Um, you've obviously got your big one of this world, which is your Apple Podcasts. If you like what you've heard tonight, for some reason, if people go on and press the subscribe button on Apple Podcasts under our show, then um, it means it's sunny for the next three days. So go ahead and do that if you'd like to see some sunshine in lovely October. Um, if you like us even more, please feel free to drop us a rating or a review. Um, as we say regarding kind of ratings and reviews, um, don't give us a 10, because that'll make us big-headed. But don't give us a 1, because that'll make us cry. But give us something in the middle, like a 5, because it's, um, it's average, and we are decidedly average. But the person who's not been average today is... They're rather wonderful, they're rather amazing, they're rather spending far too much time talking to me, Mr. John E. Clare. So, John, thank you again for coming on. Um, Thanks so much for having me. Nice was good, this was a good conversation. I enjoyed this. <laughs> That's good. Um, there's only two more things to do, and the first thing is to remember that we are many things, <clears throat> but we're not wizards. Are we wizards, John? Nope, unfortunately. It's not unfortunately, it's good. It's, it's good. <laughs> it's, they oh, don't okay. need any more wizards. We don't need any more wizards. We don't need more wizards. I, no, I don't know. No. Depending on what wizardly powers I have, it might not be so bad. But I don't have any, so I don't know. <laughs> I always say, uh, was it, I like the words of Terry Pratchett, which is uh, a wizard staff has a knob on the end. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> 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 um, and the next thing to do is to say goodbye. So it is a goodbye, as I say, from... Uh, Another fantastic Mr. John D. Clare. Say goodbye, John. Good Goodbye. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> no, it's been a pleasure. And it's a goodbye from me. Remember, stay safe. Roll sixes. If you fancy fighting against the radiation, going exploring, finding new resources, battling other players, and flipping over hexagonal tiles while not having to worry about the the randomness of dice, then maybe check out Downfall. If you fancy something a bit more mysterious, then there's Mystic Veil. Vale. And obviously, coming soon, next year, which is only actually a couple of months away, is going to be Edge of Darkness. And we will obviously keep you lovely people aware of these things as they are out there in the future. But until the next time, goodbye.